So the Beyond the Binary project is all about putting queer stories at the heart of the museum. We, the project is about contesting the idea that queer stories are a new, a new thing, that queer people don't have history, and that um, it's kind of like a, a new trend that museums are pushing. Um, uh, that our project absolutely refutes that. We're um, uh, lobbying uh, for people to a broader section of um, the public to realise that there is deep roots in history here, and that's what we're trying to shout about. So you can, uh, if you're in Oxford or the UK, you'll come along and see the exhibition and Dan has helped curate that with us. Um, otherwise, there's lots of material available online. Um, and before I hand over to Dan, I just wanted to say a little bit about why we're working together. So Dan um, is a community curator on our Beyond the Binary project and Dan's undertaken the most incredible research um, and transformed generally how um, some of the museum team see objects that we thought we were really familiar with. So Dan's looked at um, historical material from the Métis community and um, his community and has reframed some of the artefacts that the museum looks after and helped us pull out um, really important stories that were hidden in those objects around um, his own lived experiences and we've put those um, we've put the objects um, on display and are hopefully presenting a more kind of diverse um, and interesting um, context to that object those objects through the exhibition. So um, Dan is a history, history master's graduate from the University of Oxford and that is the farthest from, from home he has ever been. Um, so welcome back to Oxford Dan uh, and Dan's family roots are in, in St Laurent Manitoba um, and this distance has tremendously affected how he views cultural ret retention as a Métis trans man living in one of the most impactful colonial countries in North America's history. Dan is self-labelled as a um, disconnected native. He is continually attempting to maintain his family's connections to their home territory through art, mainly bead beadwork, cooking his grandmother's recipes and storytelling. Dan has worked in public programming and visitor services for the Smithsonian. Um, Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, as well as the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So Dan's got an incredible um, kind of experience across museums. And he's also, as I said, a community creator for the Beyond the Binary Project. He is interested in indigenizing and queering museums and cultural institutions, and thus was extremely excited for this project. So I'm going to now hand over to Dan, and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Hi, welcome everyone to the Natives Inspired Activism and Empowerment in the Arts. My name is Dan. Thank you very much for that introduction, Josie. So let's begin. Um, first off, <laughs> hi. So we have three amazing artists um, and art representative here today with our webinar, including Sydney Purcell, Nalaxis Mukash, and Lucy Fowler. So I would like to welcome the audience to this amazing opportunity we have today. Um, as Josie said, I'm a big fan of our panelists, extraordinary art and activism. So we have a lot of hardworking um, artists today and a lot of interdisciplinary and mixed media art, including beadwork, textiles, illustrations, prose, we cover a lot of ground. So first I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction to each of the panelists that we were fortunate enough to have today. Um, let's start with Sydney Purcell or Sydney Jane Brooke Campbell Maybrier Purcell. Um, Sydney is an interdisciplinary op, uh, artist. She specializes in socially engaged performance art, activism. She works on video collaborations and interactive community art. And she's also an enrolled member of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. Sydney is continually exploring her roots both as an indigenous person and also her Irish Catholic roots in her work. She also devotes time to projects related to food sovereignty and language revitalization and loss within her community. She also tackles stereotyping, appropriation, and local history. And she describes herself succinctly as an artist, an educator, and very Midwestern. Our next speaker, we have uh, Naloxis Mukash, who is a member of the uh, EU Ichi. I knew I was going to mess that up. A uh, Cree community based in Wat Magusti, um, and that's in northern Quebec. And they work predominantly in beadwork, photography, and illustration. Um, a lot of their work and art is inspired and influenced by their Cree culture, legends, and the natural landscapes of Uistchi. 
And during lockdown, they actually developed an range of community oriented uh, activities and projects, including their bead in your style hashtag challenge. Um, an Eastern James Bay Cree language revitalization project, and they continue to use their illustrations, beadwork, and photography to create stories developed for, for and by Native people. Lastly, we have uh, Métis academic Lucy Fowler, co-editor of the Mama Wee Project, which is what she's representing today. It's a Métis-led collective of young people um, which aims to create space for youth to rebuild relations to their community, discuss the future of the Métis Nation, and to celebrate their community through art, mainly through digital storytelling and in-person gatherings. Now the project pushes the community to think critically and to take action on building a stronger Métis Nation, which is very important to her um, as she is actually an educator. So she's very interested in activism um, through prose, published zines, digital language revitalization, and her own research focuses on indigenous youth uh, experiences. And she feels very, very passionate about creating an educational environment that honors and respects indigenous ways of knowing and being. So again, we have a lot of ground to cover, a lot of different art styles, um, and a little bit of activism to learn about and the inspiration and motives for ensuring there are spaces for native expression in both artistic and traditionally um, settler dominated places like museums and institutions. And this is because indigenous people have continually created work of, works of art for function, cultural expression and meaningful connection for thousands of years, as well as culturally um, to empower ourselves and our communities and whether that medium is traditional or cultural, it's used to basically inherently rooted in activism. So to be an indigenous is to share your identity today through art, which is a very revolutionary way to walk this world. So especially historically when colonial laws have often made it extremely challenging to dig into what we maybe consider traditional or cultural art as native peoples. So that's why we have these three amazing artists today who are gonna share some of their work with us. Um, and I'm going to start you off with Sydney Purcell. So Sydney, if you're ready. I am. All right. Aha, Hanwe P. Sydney Jane Brooke, Campbell Maybrier Purcell, Hinganyeki, Bajajaminyeki. Hello and good day to you all. I am oldest daughter. My name is Sydney Jane Brooke Campbell Maybrier Purcell and I'm a member of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska or we call ourselves Bajoje. Um, so I'm a Bajoje woman. I'm gonna start by just telling you a little bit of background about myself and then I'll just go into some of my more socially active and activist uh, projects, more of my larger scale public ones. Um, so about me, I come from a very large family. My mother is one of 10 kids. She's Irish Catholic. And then I get my Native American heritage from my father's side. He's a semi-nomadic adventurer and artist. Um, he does beadwork, moccasin making, printmaking, painting. It's just kind of an all around artist. My mom on the other hand is a social worker. So I kind of took my two parents' professions and merged them into what I, identify myself as, which is a socially engaged artist. So the social work and the art kind of put together. Um, I grew up in Kansas City, which is a city in the middle of the United States. Um, but I grew up away from my tribal reservation and away from my tribal community. So while I always knew that I was Indian because I had a CDIB, it stands for Certificate Degree of Indian Blood card that I carried around in my wallet from when I was a kid. Um, I knew I was Indian, but I didn't grow up in the community. Um, my parents and grandparents always made sure that I had a connection to the community. So we'd go to powwows within the city as well as our tribes powwow and cultural encampment every year on our tribes reservation. So I always had you know, a foot in the door but still felt uncomfortable with my own identity growing up because I wasn't as connected as some other people and because I look the way that I do. Um, growing up with Pocahontas is like my number one inspiration, knowing I was Indian, but knowing I didn't look like Pocahontas or any of, any of the Indian dolls that my grandmother gave me for every birthday um, made me feel uncomfortable and unsure of myself. 
So when I started learning more about indigenous culture and assimilation in college, I started making a series of projects um, to educate others about native identity and representation within popular culture. If you'd like to go to the next slide, Dan. Um, this is my first large scale public art project that I created. Um, in school, I started collecting anything and everything that had an Indian on it because I was doing a research project about the representations of Indians in society today, um, which is the name of this project as well. It's a, quite a mouthful, just like my own name. Um, so I collected anything with an Indian on it. And my friends started collecting them too whenever they'd come across them. So it's a lot of like sports teams, um, mascots. We have a lot of made in China dream catchers. There's a lot of Halloween costumes or kids toys, um, cowboys and Indians things. There's also a bunch of like things made by the Boy Scouts of America that are, they look like they could be native, but they're not. Um, and mixed in with all of this kind of Indian kitsch, I also included some authentic, it's not a word that I use often, um, so I'll put it in quotes, some items, regalia items mostly and moccasins made by indigenous people within the teepee. Um, I set this teepee up on university campuses and in parks around the country. Um, on the left side, it's set up in San Francisco. On the right, it's a small college in Missouri where I live. Um, when you set up something like this in a park or on a college campus, people will come to you. So it was really easy to get audience. Um, and an audience that might not normally go to an art museum per se. Um, so set up the teepee, filled it with all of these items and then invited people to come inside to do a scavenger hunt activity where they try to find the real native items amongst all of the kitsch. And that gave us a starting point to begin a conversation. So I could, I'm not the kind of person that's gonna go to a sporting event and protest outside of it. I don't know if that's in a very effective way to get sports teams mascots changed perhaps, um, because it's just gonna be a bunch of drunk people that don't wanna hear what you're saying. But if you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone in this space, you might have more of a, a way to get your point across. And you can also meet the people where they're at. And if they don't know anything at all about native culture, you could start really low, but if they already know a ton about identity and representation, we can, we can go from there. So it's a way to start conversations with people in a one-on-one -on -one, um, setting. And we can go to the next slide, Dan. I'm also super interested in machines. Um, and I think this stems from them just being a big part of my childhood. Um, and I love things that are interactive. So I hate going into museums or art galleries and not being able to touch anything. So I like to create things that other people can touch. So there are a few different reasons for this. Um, one is because it engages audiences of all kinds. Um, it might be less easy to walk past something like a functional claw machine than a painting in a gallery. Um, it forces people to stop and interact and spend time with the work if it's interactive. And then it creates a more memorable experience so you can recall it and maybe think about it in the future if, you, if you're using more than one sense, if you can touch it and taste it or something like that. So after I'd collected all these items and I'd been showing my TP project for a while, I didn't really know what to do with them. And I was kind of sick of collecting all of them. And I had just amassed a huge, huge collection. So I decided to create the Indian Giver, which is a fully functional claw machine. You could pay it for an American, play it for an American quarter. Um, and you can actually win things. Actually the claw is too good. So people won more often than I had intended. I needed to like loosen the claw mechanism so that people won less. Um, and the point of this project was all of these representations were put onto indigenous people by mass society. So I'm inviting mass society to take those representations back um, and let indigenous peoples decide how to represent themselves. An Indian giver is a pretty slang word for someone that gives something and takes it back. Um, it's not a very nice term for native peoples. Um, so that is one of my machines that I've made. And then Dan, if you wanna go to the next slide. This is probably, this is my most recent machine. I have a few other interactive machines that people can play that touch on native identity as well, or some of them are just complete joke machines. Um, this one is one that I made in 2019. And 
the reason I'm drawn to this machine, and I think it's my most successful one, is because it not just points out the problem as the Indian giver did, it kind of says, you know, these, this is what's wrong with um, all these representations of Indians, but it doesn't offer any solutions for how to fix that. Um, where this seed ball machine, it's a gumball machine that I filled with seed balls. That's just a bunch of dirt with uh, either wildflower or milkweed seeds in them. And people can buy them for a quarter. Um, they often dispense two at a time. And you can take them and then plant them or seed bomb any place that you think would benefit from milkweed and wildflower seeds so that we can help protect our pollinators and create safe spaces for them, um, for our butterflies and bees. Next slide, Dan. Um, I'm also I'm super interested in educating people about the diversity that exists among indigenous tribes. So for the project of the feast, um, it's an ongoing project where I'm going through each tribe within the United States. I needed a starting spot. So I, I haven't gone into Canada or um, other places on this continent yet, but um, there's 573 plus tribes just within the United States alone. So I'm going through them alphabetically and creating a plate for each one and then a place mat underneath it that tells the participant to the feast about that tribe. Then I invite people to come eat indigenous foods that I've sourced from indigenous brands. So I use um, Red Lakes wild rice. My own tribe makes honey. So I uh, use their honey. Um, I do red corn fry bread um, and a bunch of other products, tatanka, beef jerky. Um, there's also a, an ahi tuna jerky that's made by a native owned company. So I serve, all, I serve and promote these native owned brands during this feast. And the only thing the audience, their only job is to eat some delicious food and learn one thing about a single tribe. Um, as they're each reading, something about their tribe, they can discuss it with the people around them, you know, something that they've learned. Um, the feast changes a little bit each time that I do it. So originally I was doing them on styrofoam plates and I was hand stippling them with a needle, the, each tribal seal or tribal flag design onto the plate, which was kind of cool because as you were eating, the juices of your food would seep into all of the stippled designs um, and kind of reveal the image but styrofoam is not sustainable. So I decided to switch and now I make them out of um, wooden plates, which I used to hand burn individually and they could take up to five hours for each plate, which was kind of insane. Um, so I've recently bought a laser engraver and now I laser engrave the plates um, and then do research about each tribe. Um, the newest thing that I've included in the very last feast that I did was QR codes. So you, you could actually scan the placemat and it would just link you directly to that tribe's website and you can learn from the tribe about the tribe, which I think is really important for self-representation. Um, I collect all the plates and take pictures of them after the event. So that's why there's stains on all of these plates. I just find them super interesting and kind of, it's my way to record the, that event happening um, and someone eating off of that tribe's plate. Um, at the end, I usually give out prizes to anyone that will share with the, with the group um, something that they've learned. And giving away prizes really helps people to participate. So that was pretty exciting to learn. Uh, Dan, you can go to the next slide. In addition to making artwork for non-Native people that educates them about Native culture um, and representation and identity, I also have kind of a second body of work that's made for my own tribal community. Um, in graduate school, I moved closer to the reservation than I'd ever lived before. And I had a car for the first time so I could go back and forth to our reservation. And I was able to get more involved with the people that are there. Um, so for my first community wide project, uh, it was called the Bajoje Language Community Arts Project. And uh, it was twofold. For the first one, the first part of the project was just to increase the visibility of the language on the reservation. So I just needed more signs. And my hope was that if people saw these stop signs on the reservation, they'd be interested in learning how to say that word maybe. So for stop, it's nastane. Um, and then maybe through just showing more signs, uh, it would get people interested. To further 
to actually get people involved in learning the language, the second part of the project was to ask tribal members to create their own sayings in Bahoje um, themselves. They had to do the work themselves to translate something that they would like to see on a bumper sticker. So then people could put these on their cars and then it would further increase the visibility of the language while also forcing people to figure out how to use the resources to learn the language. So we had an online dictionary that they could use and a series of YouTube videos. And there's also a primer that was made in like the 70s. So they could use those three resources to come up with phrases. And then we worked with language experts to make sure that they were correct. I then designed bumper stickers for each person and sent them like 10 of each so they could give them out to their friends and family as well. So just trying to actually get people involved in the language, not just seeing it. Um, that's the first project that I did for my community. Uh, Dan, we can go to the next one. Other projects include, um, this is a Nahachi build. So I worked with tribal elder Pete Fee, some tribal members of our tribe and other tribes, and then students from the university to learn how to create our own Nahachi, which is Bark Lodge in our language. Um, and that was just a fun educational project to learn with my community. We can go to the next one. I also do murals on the reservation. Well, I've done one mural on the reservation and I will be soon to do another one and then another one. Um, so there will be a whole series of murals that will be happening on the reservation with different parts of the community. Um, this is just the first one that we created. It's in White Cloud, Kansas, which is the town that was named after our tribal chief. And we can go to the next slide. And this final project, which we will show a video of at the very, very end, if you want to stick around after our panel discussion to watch, it's like a three and a half minute long video um, about this project that I did with a bunch of replica statues of liberty. Um, it was on Earth Day. And so I wanted to do this project that kind of promoted Earth Day and promoted an indigenous respect for and responsibility towards the Earth. I wanted to combat misrepresentation of Native peoples with positive representations of Native peoples and self-representation. So I asked women if they would be interested. Um, I got the inspiration from the image in the middle of this slide, which is a photograph by Stephen Paul Judd. He's a very famous Native um, artist. And he took this photo that he drew a girl in a jingle dress and just held it up in front of the Statue of Liberty. And when I was thinking about doing a public art project, I was researching every statue that existed in the Kansas City area. And I realized that there are 50 of these replica Statues of Liberty within the two states that I live in and travel to often, which is Kansas and Missouri. Um, they were all made by the Boy Scouts of America and they're just like miniature six foot versions of the statue. And I realized that I could actually physically make what Stephen Paul Judd did happen in real life. Um, so I kind of did a pilot project where I asked Indigenous women if they'd be interested um, in participating, took their photographs, kind of morbidly chopped off their heads, so that only their regalia was showing, and then decorated all of these Statues of Liberty as Indigenous women. Um, it was a way to, in addition to promoting Earth Day, to um, empower Indigenous women and highlight the diversity that exists among tribes, tribal communities, different regalia styles, um, and the Statue of Liberty also serves as this welcome beacon to the United States, it's, you know, saying hello, welcome to the United States. Um, but really, the indigenous peoples were the first people that were here. So I've kind of subverted that image to represent the descendants of the original inhabitants of the country that I live in. Um, and it was a pretty fun project. Um, the Boy Scout connection is also super important to me, but it doesn't quite come across in the way that I've done the first version. Um, and I hope to do this project again because I only got four statues decorated, but there are 50 between the two states that I live between. Um, so I have plans to do this project again and I would get permission next time I were to do it. Um, so that's just a little bit about the work that I create, especially more of my activist centered work. I also do a lot of um, performance art and I make a lot of wearable outfits for performances or videos that I make as well. Um, but since this one was activist oriented, I wanted to talk about these projects. 
And one of I ended with this one because it's not just a project for non-natives or for my tribe, but it's for everyone. It both empowers women and educates people about indigenous people. So I will stop there and I will let you go on to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Sydney, for that. I really appreciate all your work, especially the performance aspects. Um, the, uh, the actual claw machine is one of my personal favorites. All right, let's move on. We'll see that video as Sydney said in the end. If you'd like to stay, you're more than welcome to. Gorgeous, really, really inspiring video with a beautiful soundtrack. Um, now we move on to our next presenter, Nalaxis Mukash. So, Alrighty, hi. I'm gonna mute myself and you go on ahead. You guys are gonna really love this. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dan. Um, lovely presentation by Sydney. That was very wonderful. All right, so um, <laughs> my name is uh, Nell Axis. I'm uh, Cree uh, EU from, from uh, um, Wabaxi, Quebec. It's a very unique um, community because we're neighbors, very, very close neighbors with uh, the Inuit community of Kujurapik. Um, so we have both of those, uh, our Cree culture and our, and the Inuit culture here in this community. Um, it's a remote community, so we are isolated. Um, you can only get in by plane. Um, I'm a beat artist, illustrator, and photographer, and I am self-taught. Uh, we don't have that many resources in my community, so everything I've learned has been from like the internet or uh, trial and error by myself and by my mother and my stepfather, who are both artists. My stepfather is a musician and my mother is also a beat artist uh, recently and an acrylic painter. So everything is very self-taught. I'm very patient with myself and working with that. Um, and because I am self-taught, I do a lot of, uh, um, what, what are they called? Oh, workshops uh, that I teach bead, bead work, uh, beading and uh, art also. I'm very open to teaching all that. Um, I know how very, how difficult it is to have access in my community too. Um, I've, I don't speak my language fluently, but I do understand it. So a lot of my work is very much inspired by Cree language for to also teach myself as I'm a very visual person. Um, visual learning is where it's at for me. <laughs> um, I'm also, uh, my work is also very inspired by, by Cree legends and by the lands, the land here. So Uh We can go to the next slide. Okay, <laughs> so with my illustrations, I'm very much, um, um, I, that's how I express myself is through my illustrations. Um, I deal a lot with uh, anxiety and depression and I'm very open about it. Uh, artwork is where I am able, to, it's an outlet for me to be able to express myself. So I'm very open about it, it's nothing that I, I'm uncomfortable with talking about because a lot of people have come to me to tell me that they've also connected with my artwork in emotions and anything. So I don't, I don't like to say much. I don't like to write much um, online or even speak about it. So I usually let my artwork speak for myself. So I'm sorry if I stumble also <laughs> speaking. Um, when events happen or things that happen in my life or in my life experience, I will usually draw it. And it is very personal to me, but people can interpret it also for how they like and how it will help them. So I am very, again, very open to sharing. It's something that is very personal to me, but I welcome anybody to interpret the artwork however they like to. So with the recent, um, I will talk about a little bit about residential school. Um, I, when, as indigenous people, we've always known these things have, have happened. Um, 
it you know that the the proof is there now but we always knew that you know the stories and everything right now we have the res first residential school gathering here in my community and there are stories and everything and we've known this you know like even before they found the children at the first as at the first residential school so of course when i heard about it you know i was i was very shocked and i was very surprised but it was mostly because you know how long did it take everybody to believe us to believe that these things were happening that that these things happened to us and you know how long did it take for people to um just to to believe us you know we're very much storytellers and and you know we 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 share these things but it it did it took a long time and so with this piece here the 251 single braids i created and again this is very personal and um this i think it's this no this one is 251 but i created another one which had had many more braids and people were asking me why it was only why there was more braids but the thing is i knew that this wasn't going to be the only wasn't going to be the only mass grave that was going to be found so again the artwork is very much interpretive it's about loss it's about grief cut braids represent death or loss and it is very personal to uh, indigenous people so again the artwork could be for anything you know it's it's the loss of life it's the loss of childhood it's the loss of it's it's grief you you grieve for many things and for this it was that so we can go to the to the next slide so uh like i said i don't uh speak my language very fluently but i understand a lot of it so when i'm when it's spoken to me i do understand um i always had a hard time with writing in high school as we have cree language class here um, so I wanted to get more into that, but also to help me uh, to with pronunciation, but also with with others, because I for me and I always only speak for myself and my experiences. Um, yes, I'm a Cree artist and, you know, my work can be very representative, representative of EUSG, but they're always all my own experiences, too. Um, so with these ones I created um, for uh, well, to learn Cree <laughs> for myself too. And uh, a lot of people have reached out here because um, that I've noticed that um, a lot of Cree, uh, our youth here um, are speaking English a lot more. And that mostly has to do with how the school system is working here and how um, uh, the Cree nation mostly promotes how important going to higher education down south is so it's really important to learn to learn English except I have a very um, interesting relationship with school and how I feel about school too of course I don't discourage anybody going to school or anything like that but I find but language revitalization and culture and everything like that is very important to me um, because I also did, I didn't uh, necessarily grow up I did, not necessarily I didn't grow up um learning a lot about the culture but you know i did go to goose break i did go to and did a lot of cultural activities but i still don't fluently speak cree so this project was very interesting it's very slow because it's also a personal project so i work on it whenever i have time and i put i'll post it on my instagram and this is for the uh northern james bay cree dialect uh, we're EU on the coastal, and then there's the, uh, they're Inu inland. Uh, so they have their southern dialect, and we have the northern dialect. So all the, all the pronunciations and stuff is all for my dialect and my community. So we can go to the next side. Um, I'm very present online. Um, I mostly will. Everything I do, again, is on my own time. Um, I love to support other Indigenous artists, but also to use my platform to uh, give exposure, I, I guess you can say, to other Indigenous artists, but also just very much being within the community of uh, online. Because over the years that I've been online, 
um, there is a lot of misrepresentation, but also there's a lot of um, anger about a lot of things too. And I find that sometimes all, of course, there's every right to be angry about the things that we're, we're angry about, but it gets buried under, you know, the positive or the indigenous artists that we have. And that, you know, that the ones that are speaking uh, on these issues too, and the ones that are, are just creating such a wonderful community online. And being indigenous too, I had a very hard time because I did go to school down south. I did have a very hard time finding my community um, in the city. So when I moved back to here, of course, uh, you know, I was with my family and very close to my family. So creating that space online to uh, connect with other indigenous artists, but also just to connect with, you know, other, other peoples too, and to create that community where we can uh, communicate, talk, share knowledge for even people who are in the city or who are disconnected from their culture too, or from their tribe. Um, to see that online so that it's easy for them to find too. So um, once a year I do a support indigenous artists and I create a post and everybody shares underneath uh, like, you know, the uh, artists that they like or themselves there for their artwork or for whatever that they do. So here I have a portrait of that I did of Chief Ladybird and Lisa Walker who are both very, um, amazing artists themselves. So if you check, check out their work, uh, we can go to the next slide. So it's my bead work. <laughs> um, I'm uh, self-taught in, in beading. Uh, it's become quite popular within the Cree nation. Um, beading has always been, I mean, well, you know, for, for a long time. Um, we've done embroidery and it's been very, uh, it's very important uh, as part of our clothing, especially the hunting bags and everything. And like the traditional wear where everything had a design on them. They have very meaningful, uh, there's a reason why for that, um, which I, I, I also don't really know, but I also uh, can't share because it's more within, within our culture too. So these are my pieces that I create. I'm very inspired by um, pop culture, uh, modern culture, I, I think that's how you say it, sorry. <laughs> and by the natural landscape. So I try to mix both with like modern and traditional too, because you know, I'm, I am also allowed to exist in a modern world too. So I very much like mixing all of that. And that's within like pop culture and everything. So, you know, I very, I like, and I like very spooky stuff. So the skeletons were <laughs> fun. And uh, yeah, that's my bead work. Go next. So again, with uh, creating, this is my Be This In Your Style challenge. Uh, this wasn't the first one I posted, but this is one of them that I posted on my personal page. So again, going back to creating a very open, very safe community too, but also with uh, a lot of indigenous people beating as a way to reconnect with their culture too. And that's in through any way possible. So when I do those, I used to do um, um, tuto live tutorials and that was for anybody to come and learn how to bead in any way that they, and, and creating earrings and creating pins, anything that they wanted, I would be able to, I would talk to them for free online and I would be able to guide them through that. So the Be This New Style Challenge is one of the things that I found very important for, for everybody, for everybody learning beading, for anybody learning how to bead and just to create a community too. Cause there are, I won't go into it, but there, you know, there are, um, it's a very deep conversation on beading too and the styles and where it comes from and everything. But this community was for today. What, you know, learning how to bead and beading, it's for today and for you and for anybody who wanted to, because I know how stressful it can be to always thinking about the next design or, you know, how to make money or anything like that. And this was just a way to remember why you're beading too and you know, why you started. And so I created fun designs um, like this one. 
which was very popular. <laughs> and it was very amazing to see everybody's interpretation of the design also because everybody sees things differently. So actually you can go to the hashtag baby Yoda be this in your style challenge, be this in your style on Instagram and you'll see the many uh, different interpretations of this design. If you also go to the be this in your style uh, challenge on Instagram there, I have its very own Instagram page. You can see all the other beadworks too of many different people, not just indigenous people too, uh, and how they interpret design. So seeing like, uh, for me, which was very interesting was seeing the different types of uh, styles and interpretations too, which I think is very, very interesting because it helps to understand that people see the world very differently and that, you know, whether it's they saw something else in the design or anything like that, then they would beat it and it would be completely different from somebody else's design. So this is a very fun challenge. Uh, and it, the works are still, you can still see them on the Instagram page and everybody's password too. Okay. <laughs> so I'm also a photographer. Um, <laughs> I do a lot. Um, I'm, I'm self-taught in photography and my community has, is very supported, supportive of my photography. Um, I take a lot of photos of the natural landscapes of uh, what Max do. I like to take uh, portraits also. Um, I just very much, photography has always been a passion. So it was something I kind of just picked up and I, you know, I really like to do it. And uh, to be able to capture like moments or feelings of how the land is and how it made me feel too, because it is very peaceful over here. It's quite, it's pretty quiet. Um, and it's very, uh, like you can go for a five minute drive out and you're already like out on the land alone. Like it's, it's, it's very isolated here and it's quite beautiful out there. So you know, uh, being able to offer also this service to my community um, for this, for my photography, it was very much more of a hobby of mine, something that I just very much like doing and something that I um, uh, like to offer my community too. So I love taking family portraits. I think it's very fun to talk with the families here and to take photos for them and to be able to give them this a service that usually is only available down south, but to able to give them the full like experience of family photos too. And photos are so important of capturing moments in time. And so uh, that's what my, mostly my photography is, is my community and yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks thank for listening. you so much. That was really, really lovely. Uh, Naloxis, I especially liked how you talked about, you know, especially with the braids, showing grief and digesting grief um, in a way that's visual because sometimes we cannot put that to through words. Um, and I really liked how accessible your art is, especially beadwork. So we're going to move on to Lucy Fowler. Hello, Lucy. Um, and I'm going to let you introduce um, yourself and your project, the Mamali Project, of which Lucy is the co-editor of. Okay, thank you, Dan. Tanchi Kiawal, Wamari Tolian, P. Lucy Fowler, Dishna Kershon, Winnipeg Dushjin, Maga, Dan Kiskea, Niwikin, and Machif Nia. So I'm Lucy Fowler. Uh, I'm born and raised in Winnipeg, Canada, uh, but currently living in Kiskea, which is land um, called the Dominican Republic right now. So my family were Sinclairs, Cummings, Prudens, Nortons, and others who took script in St. Andrews, Manitoba, and of other family and ancestors from Red River, Oxford House, Norway House, and Sioux Valley, as well as settler family from Carlow, Ireland, and then the Orkney Islands. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Manitoba, uh, focusing on Indigenous education, queer theory, and youth culture. Um, I do some beadwork and other art forms myself, but uh, my focus is really on prioritizing and uplifting Indigenous youth voices. So I've been part of several different projects, including um, Red Rising Magazine, but the organization that I'm here to talk to you about today and our work is the Mamoy Project. Go to the next slide, Dan, thanks. 
Um, so the Mamoid project came about a few years ago um, when we, we call ourselves a group of young, Métis young-ish people. It started off Métis young people. We're kind of aging out of this bracket at this point. We'll just have to be Métis people at some point, um, but across the homelands. And we wanted to kind of come together and create spaces uh, for ourselves to see each other and build relationships and build kinship connections outside of kind of the boundaries of you know, academic organizations or governmental gatherings. Those were kind of like the big ways that we would get together. We wanted to create other spaces for our nation and for our youth. I'm um, just like uh, Nalaxis and Sydney are both talking about this like disconnection. So also the Memoi project is really about like bringing people together uh, and helping me to youth connect more deeply to their communities. So Memoi is a word in Cree and Anishinaabe Moan and in Midshif that means together. And so just the idea is that we're bringing people together um, across, you know, across the country that's currently called Canada um, because of the history of um, dispossession of land and you know, diasporic movement, Métis communities are really dispersed and a lot of people aren't even living on Métis homelands anymore. Um, so they might not be able to connect in these physical community spaces. And as Indigenous people, our connections to our homeland are so important, right? Like um, maintaining relationship to the land is essential. And so through virtual community building, we try to center land in that work as well. Um, you know, not replacing land-based work, not replacing those connections, but creating new um, ways to access, um, access those community spaces. And also as part of this work, we're really mindful that you know, Métis homeland um, covers a number of shared territories with Indigenous people. So how do we act as better um, allies to other Indigenous nations, other, better relatives to other Indigenous communities, um, both in the real world and in digital spaces as well. Uh, and so, you know, we use a lot of different um, technologies to kind of accomplish these goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of them, but kind of our main, our main goals with the project um, are both uh, knowledge mobilization. So, you know, being able to take some of our shared expertise and our shared experiences and being able to share them um, with our community members, as well as relationship building. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we work towards these goals in a variety of ways. I'm going to next slide, Dan. Uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit about a few different projects. Um, this is an uh, image of the cover and also the editor page of a zine that we created a few years ago. So I know I just said that our, most of our work is digital, and it is especially now during the pandemic, but um, we did in 2019 have a gathering in Saskatchewan called the Journeying Home Gathering. And we got some funding. We were able to bring Métis youth from across um, Canada to Saskatchewan to spend a week together on the land, um, doing different activities together, learning about um, different art forms, sitting with elders uh, and community members and you know, building those relationships. So out of that gathering um, came a zine. Um, we kind of made a call out to folks who had been at that gathering, but also uh, other folks. So one of the elders that we sat with during that gathering in 2019 um, was Maria Campbell, who's a Métis elder living in Saskatchewan as well. And she talked a lot about the importance of visiting or Keokewin, which is the name of our, our zine. And so we wanted to really focus on like the ways that we visit and the ways that we gather and build these relationships with each other. Um, so we do actually have, I'm not sure if I sent the link to Josie, so I might just throw it in the chat myself, but. Uh, you can actually access the zine um, here. I just threw that, that in the chat. Um, and so the zine was really a labor of love. Myself and another co-founder of the Mumbai Project edited it. And one of our uh, collective members, Jason Zirkan, did the design, which was gorgeous. And we were able to um, print a number of these and, and ship them off to contributors and community free of costs. So to be able to share these words and these stories with our community members was really important. Move to the next slide, please. 
So this is a number of other um, events that have happened or are currently happening. Um, I'm running this series of events to kind of speak to that knowledge mobilization idea. Uh, we decided to have a series of conversations um, online, but conversations with our community members about different issues. So uh, we were calling this series the Mamoya Chimotak series, or let's tell stories together. Uh, so it's a, you know, a visiting series. Our first event was the Métis Queer Trans and Two-Spirit Histories event with Kai Pyle. Um, Kai is a Métis uh, Anishinaabe Two-Spirit person from Wisconsin. And so they talked about all of their research. They just finished their um, PhD actually, so it's Dr. Kai Pyle. Um, but they talked about their research into Métis histories. And we had a huge turnout because I think people just don't really um, don't often see themselves, Métis queer youth don't often see themselves in stories um, about queer Indigenous people or in these queer Indigenous spaces. And so we wanted to kind of create this specific space for our community. Uh, the next event is going to be, um, it's on the top left there, so it's with uh, Shanice Steele, who is an Afro-Indigenous person, and their panel is going to be called Métis Enough, a look at the life of a Black Métis. And so that's coming up um, next week, which is really exciting. Um, we also had uh, a series called Celebrating Together, which uh, was a series, I guess it's still ongoing, but a series where we profile different Métis people from across the homeland and the work that they do. So some folks are teachers or some are community members, um, youth, storytellers, artists, just anyone who's doing something really amazing and is Métis. And so we would uh, interview them and then create these profiles and share them on social media. And the last uh, square there is our upcoming zine. So we have another one. Uh, we did have another gathering uh, in this, this summer. It was online because of COVID. Uh, but out of that gathering, we had community members saying they wanted to do another zine. And they also were the ones who were asking for this knowledge mobilization series. So that's where that came from as well. But our next um, zine is going to be about owning ourselves or governing ourselves. So one of the names for the Métis uh, was Odakamsawak, which means like the people that own themselves. And so that's kind of a play on that, that term. So, so to think about, you know, how can we be better relatives to each other? How can we govern ourselves as community members um, and in, in different ways than we're used to? So we're really looking forward to being able to create something um, pretty amazing for our next in-person gathering, which will be next uh, next summer in, in May. I guess, fingers crossed that uh, COVID behaves. <laughs> we'll go to the next slide then. And so some of the other work that we do is also language revitalization work. Uh, I'm so excited to hear about Sydney and Alexis's language work too, because this is like work that we all need to be doing um, and so you'll see that there are Cree and Michif words on the screen here. Uh, and this is because for Métis people, um, like Michif is often said to be like the Métis language, but not all Métis people spoke Michif. Uh, and Métis people really were known for being bi, trilingual people, quadrilingual people, being able to speak all of these different languages. So there's some Métis communities that speak only Cree, some that speak Michif or um, French Michif, or um, cellular Michif, there's all these different varieties. And so in our language revitalization series, we didn't just include um, one language, we wanted to include all of the different languages that Métis people have spoke. And so part of that project as well, uh, Kai Pyle, who I spoke about a moment ago, um, spearheaded the creation of a video sharing different terms for two-spirit people in uh, for Métis communities. So we released two videos. One, this one here, this first one I've just linked is um, Kai's video about two-spirit words. And we also created a second video, which was um, spearheaded by Simone, who um, was a collective member for a long time. And this one is about Black Métis experiences. And so these two videos um, speak to kind of like where our priorities are in terms of becoming better, better relatives to each other. Um, as we go forward. So that's all I have to say about our slides, but I'm really thankful to be here with these two amazing artists and, and 
have some conversation around these ideas. Thank you so much for that, Lucy. Um, I am a big, big fan of the zine. Um, and at the end of this presentation, we do have um, contact links where you can look at all the updated pro uh, projects and community collaborations that all of these wonderful artists are engaging with. So now, um, since we are almost hitting 7 p.m., I'm going to spearhead the conversation just, just one question. I know we have a bunch of uh, questions from our wonderful audience, which is really great. Very happy that you are all so enthusiastic about our wonderful uh, creators and artists today. So um, I just kind of wanted to ask, because we are a webinar that is titled you know, Natives Inspired, and I know um, previously we've talked, Lucy, you just talked about how not all Métis people um, spoke Machif, you know, there was Cree and Anishinaabe Moen. Um, Sydney, you talked about how you wanted to connect not just with your community, but also other communities, not just in the United States, but also in what is called Canada and all those other areas. And um, Naloxis, uh, you also mentioned, which I think is really poignant, how basically that you're not just, you are a Cree artist, but that's not your entire um, role view and um, there's so many other things that inform how you create and as a Cree artist you're not going to be the same as another Cree artist um, so I just wanted to maybe ask um, for the first question that we can take it to the audience um, what makes an artist a native or indigenous artist is there such a thing as you know indigenous art native art um, and for that matter traditional native art contemporary native art I know uh, Naloxis mentioned that you know, you know they can live in the modern world, the the contemporary world. Just maybe um, if you all want to talk a little bit about that, or if you want to have a little mini conversation, and then we can switch it off to the questions in the chat. Do you want to start, <laughs> Naloxis? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I can. Doesn't matter. Okay. No, I don't mind. It's okay. <laughs> um, I don't uh, like to categorize categorize myself as a uh, in indigenous that I make indigenous art because my work is very personal. It is very um, sorry, Tisa. It is very it is very personal, and like I said, that um, it is more a reflection of my feelings and everything. And, you know, I just happen to be also, well, I don't just happen to be, I am an Indigenous person. <laughs> and um, I don't like to be put into um, kind of this box of what an Indigenous artist should be or what, in, you know, what Indigenous art is. Because again, I have a very, uh, uh, how I feel about that too, and how, you know, Indigenous Indigenous art has been represented before, which was by also non-Indigenous artists uh, depicting Indigenous art. Um, and how, you know, that, that makes me feel and everything. And, you know, if you look at my work too, you know, everyone's like, well, we can see the Indigenous part of it, and which is very interesting because I'm like, well, what do you, what do you think is Indigenous? Or, you know, what is, what do in, does Indigenous art look like? And the thing is, it can look like many different things because there are so many different different types of artists. And again, you know, we're indigenous people, but there are so many different tribes and there are so many different cultures too and language. And um, you know, I say I'm a Cree, I'm a Cree artist, but mostly just to let you that's just really to tell you where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, I don't oh, I don't care so much about the labels either. So I I'm an artist, I am indigenous. I think any mm -hmm. Indigenous person that makes art is an Indigenous artist. And I understand where a lot of the our artists that came before us were against being labeled as an Indigenous artist. They wanted to be an artist that is Indigenous versus an Indigenous artist because back in the you know, 80s, 90s, all, and still today, I mean, it's, they get uh, stuck in, 
with those labels. And then they're not in contemporary shows. They're only in contemporary native art shows, but they're only being showed with other native artists and not other contemporary artists or alongside anyone else in a museum. It's just, oh, we'll put all the natives together. And I mean, that still happens and it is one way to give native peoples more of a voice. Um, and I understand why we are still confined to shows with only other native peoples. Um, but I think if you are an indigenous person and you make art, you're an indigenous artist in my, in my view. Whether your art is super traditional or has any resemblance of your native culture or not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think like for myself when I was growing up, um, you know, I was always connected to my community, but we were like urban, uh, urban Métis people. So we didn't have like a huge connection to the land or to kind of like those traditions. And so um, I often didn't see myself reflected in like Métis art as like, if I don't jig and I don't be, then like, <laughs> what kind of Métis am I? Uh, and I do do those things now, but um, I think it was really important for me to create spaces where you know, Métis could see that like you don't have to stay in this historicized version. You can do it, like that's great. And those are great connections to have, but that's not the only way to be part of your community. And all of these expressions are equally valid and you're still you know, a Métis artist if you're doing hip hop or if you're doing um, beadwork or whatever it is that um, you wanna express yourself through. Yeah, I've been, I've been told before that, you know, uh, my artwork was kind of scary, which was kind of funny for me to be told that um, because, you know, I was just making the artwork the way that I like to make it <laughs> and to be told that it's, you know, not Cree or it's, you know, you should be, you should make more Cree things, which is very interesting because I am a Cree person, you know, I am EU, I, I, I make the artwork, it's, it's a very, um, it's very interesting also to have your own people tell you, you know, what is Cree or how Cree you are or how Indigenous you are um, because of, you know, the effects of colonization and all that trauma too and in themselves. So, you know, I fight very hard to, you know, tell people, well, my hour is not that scary. <laughs> um, I love your art. I love all your art, but <laughs> yeah, it makes me a lot of what you're you, you're saying it makes me feel like whose standard are you using for the measurement of your art? You know, it's it's your art. You created it. You if you want to label it, you can. If you don't want to label it, you can't. It's very interesting what you said about coming from within the community and with and outside of the community. Whose parameters are you using? Um, and it's a very traditional way of, you know, like, because this is a museum webinar, but dictating, you know, what levels of indigenous, what's kish, what's traditional, what's performative, what's sacred, what cannot be mentioned, what can be consumed. It's just, it shifts and it's very interesting, especially to hear from um, you three, because you're all so varied um, in your artwork. But again, it's, we can all four of us self-identify as native because we know our you know we have connection to our communities to our nations to our band but some person may say well you don't know the language or you okay you don't know how to jig or you don't know how to make bannock you know it's well who's whose measurement am i doing so it's very interesting um i think we're going to now give it to the um q a section if that's all right with you three to our lovely audience members they've been very patient um, so let's take a look. Okay, um, we have some questions. Um, specifically, this one's a little bit more detailed to um, the UK um, and museums in general. So if you have any thoughts on this, um, should UK museums be collecting your work to educate people here? Would you be comfortable with this? Um, and we do have some uh, collections um, from originating community communities um, at the Pitt Rivers Museum, some of which that were um, specifically made to be um, sold to the museum. So uh, we're not gonna solve this in a day, but if you could give some of your thoughts. My answer is yes. <laughs> they should collect work by living indigenous artists to help support them. I think it's very important that we support um, artists that are creating today and not just things that are historical. The problem with collecting in museums mostly comes with 
NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Graves uh, Repatriation Act. Um, so there are sacred items that were dug up from burial sites. Those things need to be returned to the communities that they came from. Um, but I think collecting contemporary indigenous work is a great way um, to support native peoples and um, would be very respectful. I agree. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. And I think like there's some things like the sacred items, absolutely, but there's also some art that maybe should also be repatriated that was taken from community members who, you know, maybe didn't didn't sell it out of their own free will or wasn't sold at all, right? Some those things, I think if people don't know the history of the item, it should just be returned to the community. Um, that's kind of where I draw the line. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so many amazing artists, like you can be purchasing from these artists directly and um, increasing their visibility and, and supporting them that way. One thing I will say that does become complicated is because native identity is so complicated. Um, and a lot of museums now, which I think is fine, I mean, they, they move to a self-identification. So if a person says they're native, they just take their word for it if they're applying for a, a position at a university or an art show. Um, and then it will come out later that they're not actually indigenous or they've claimed this identity and it turns out to be false or maybe they were told these stories when they were growing up so they full wholeheartedly believed them they believed they were indigenous and then someone does the research and finds out it's untrue um, which can be very very complicated um so i think indigenous identity is also it's two ways you need to accept your own indigenous community and your indigenous community needs to accept you in return. Um, but then how do you, when you, someone's hiring for a position, do you have to go to the community and be like, do you know this person? Like whose re responsibility is, does that become? Is it the curator's responsibility to go find uh, the person's community and, and verify their whole genealogy? Um, so it's not an easy answer or solution to to figure out someone's identity. Um, and it's super complicated, especially in, in indigenous communities where I live. And it was purposely made to be confusing and due to colonial law and all of that as well. And it, you're right, it does get very sticky. You don't wanna tread on the toes of disconnected native um, peoples, but you also don't want indigeneity to become commodified. So yeah, it's very complicated. <laughs> Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, are there any cultural organizations that you know of collecting Indigenous work in respectful ways that you think are working? So I know some of you have um, done collaborations with um, other organizations, um, small scale museums, as well as um, just other you know, online event kind of things. Doesn't necessarily have to be museums or institutions, it can be maybe um, outside of your community that you see have really worked. Um, we talked a little bit about that though, being respectful and, and all that. I can jump in. Uh, so one exhibit that was touring across, I think North America, but it might've been um, internationally as well, um, was the Walking With Our Sisters exhibit, which was led by Christy Belcourt, who's a Métis artist um, and She'd asked for people to bead um, or decorate ma uh, moccasin vamps, which is that like circular piece that goes on the top of the moccasin to represent all of the missing and murdered indigenous women and two-spirit people. Um, and then this exhibit traveled to many different museums. And so I think the way that that exhibit was kind of received by museums was really respectful in the way that um, the exhibit itself, they had kind of like this freedom to design the way that it was, um, displayed. So each community had a different kind of um, display that was decided upon by elders from that community um, and ceremonial protocols were followed. And so um, I think, I don't know, I can't speak to every museum if they all followed that kind of um, uh, rule or uh, openness to following these protocols. But the ones I saw in a couple of different cities and they had um, really engaged deeply with community to, to put them on. And the other one I wanted to kind of flag was um, 
it used to be called the Winnipeg Art Gallery, where I'm from in Winnipeg. Um, they've just renamed it to the uh, Beendigan Boasia um, Gallery. And so as part of this gallery, they've also now built a second building that just opened this year um, called the Calma York um, uh, Gallery. I'm gonna, I'll put the link in the chat. And it's uh, the largest exhibit of Inuit art. Um, anyway, I think it's like 14,000 pieces at this point. And so it was designed in collaboration with uh, an Indigenous Advisory Council and with Inuit elders and community members um, as and the artists were known and consulted and communities were consulted. And so I think that process, which took a very long time, because I've been working on this gallery for, um, I think over 10 years, it took a lot of time and, and um, um, work on the part of the, the gallery, but I think it's done in a really respectful way to that art and to those communities. So it seems like the theme, indigenous led, community led, having that introspective to actually have those conversations with whoever's land you're on, you want to establish an organization or a, a workshop or a gallery, et cetera. Yeah, very, very good, very good advice. <laughs> um, I can move on to the next question. Um, I, don't, I don't have much to add. No worries. Um, some uh, another anonymous attendee so, uh, says all of your work is so important very much is um, how well are you supported by funding is there decent funding out there to support indigenous artists so that's very again a sticky question but um have any of you encountered <laughs> i don't really sell my work it's not super sellable i mean if someone wanted to buy my claw machine, I'm more than welcome to sell it to you. Um, but no one has purchased it so far. So I do support most of my projects through grant writing and I have a lot of experience with grant writing. Um, I mean, it started an undergrad with that first project. It was, I was a McNair scholar, but basically a grant to fund a research project. And I just got lucky that I was able to do it with art um, and then it was really easy to get started within the university because your pool of people you're competing against to get the grant funding um, is a lot smaller. So since then, I've started reaching out to other arts organizations just locally, um, and I just wrote my first national grant. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but within the United States, there is a decent amount of funding for artists if you live in the right places. Um, a lot of the ones that I've applied for are specific to Kansas City and you have to live within an 80 mile radius of Kansas City, which the reservation just is barely in. Um, but where I live, it's outside of it. So I have to, if I apply to that granting organization, just have to do some workarounds and apply with enough people that the majority of us live within that 80 mile radius. Um, and there's even more funding now actually with a lot of the COVID relief that's coming to our tribe and to different arts, art, organizations within the United States for sure. Um, so I just keep seeing more, more money available. I just have to apply for it. Uh, I'll just, I, I'll, for within EUSG, um, um, I encourage every, anybody who's looking for funding within their community to ask their uh, local band offices of two, but also under the um, youth council, if you're under, you know, whatever the age limit is, I think it's 35 within, for all the communities. Um, they also might have the fun. I don't, I don't know how all the youth councils work, but we also have the CNYC, which is the Cree Nation Youth Council, which is, um, has a much bigger uh, budget for, funding or for you know to and it's I find it is less complicated to ask for funding than let's say like Canada Council of the Arts or any any of the others like that where it's like a really long process to um, fill out forms and information but within the Cree Nation it's much less because also they understand like the access um, to to anything you know that um, they make it easier to to look for that. Um, I recently looked for funding within my community to help me with out with equipment for some programs that I'm doing. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've gotten back. I'm still waiting for answers, but 
there's quite a few uh, entities here that I could ask. So within my own community, there is um, support there. Uh, I don't really look for funding outside just because it is very complicated and I have very limited access to internet. Uh, we don't have high speed here and we don't have um, cell phone service. So I just very much look into locally uh, funded or, you know, I also have um, a donation page too that people can donate, donate to that's, that helps a lot too. Yeah, we've included that uh, in the end notes. Um, so again, all that contact information for these lovely artists um, and organizations, if you want to take a look at them. Um, it, I do, it does seem to think, uh, seem to me, a lot of the projects that I have been on were in collaboration with just other Native communities and, and artists, kind of na Native peoples helping other Native peoples, um, which, you know, is how we act. I mean, um, Lucy, you mentioned before being good relatives to whoever uh, you're next to on the land or whoever you engage with. So I think that's a, a really um, strong tenet. Again, though, we're all diverse and you know, different uh, outlooks. But yeah, um, does anyone else want to talk a little bit about that um, funding? And also, um, you know, I know a lot of our work um, is collaborative and we rely upon our amazing genius um, fellow artists to help us out. and log in those long hours <laughs> to make them worthwhile uh, creations. I mean, for us, the Mumbai project, um, we really just have to like piece together random grants to do anything. We mostly hadn't done everything volunteer um, basis until this year we started to be able to pay. I mean, we pay people for like their um, if they come and do a workshop with people or like we pay other people, but we're only just starting to pay ourselves as collective members for some of the organizing work we do, um, which we kind of realized we should have been doing a long time ago, but it's hard like, like to find that funding. Uh, maybe it's a Canada thing. It sounds like there's a lot more money in the States for, for arts and artists that way. But um, yeah, a lot of like the, the projects have these huge applications and like want all this information that it's just not like doable when it's just kind of like our part time um, on the side thing. Um, and so we also, yeah, we get donations and we do fundraisers. We did a fundraiser selling shirts with different names for our community, like the Métis people in the different languages on it. Um, my other work with Red Rising Magazine, we most of that came from like a seed donation from someone when we first started and then kind of um, being able to self-sustain from there. But yeah, a lot of it, it's just really grassroots, like community-led stuff. Yeah, I have one of those t-shirts, they're great. <laughs> um, all right, we have a couple other questions. Um, again, just being mindful of time, but um, question for Dan. Oh, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure, uh, audience. So I, um, have been predominantly in the museum field, uh, working with public programming and uh, community curation and as a visitor service. So I've done a lot of work in the museums, but with my art, um, I don't really, I, I guess I would maybe consider myself an artist, um, not to be self-deprecating, but I mean, come on, look who, look who we have on this panel. Um, but I do enjoy the bit of beadwork. I do enjoy, I just finished a bandolier bag actually for the Pitt Rivers Museum, just finished. It was like a year ago, two years ago, because pandemic. Um, and I just like fiddling around, making little little bags for my family members. Um, do a lot of writing, was very fortunate enough to do some writing for the Mamoy project as well. And um, I really just, I'm an avid consumer of all three of these artists' uh, creations. So that's a little bit more about me. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, for people identifying as Indigenous uh, resident in Britain, should land acknowledgements be given to ancestors of Old Britain, land you are currently living on? For example, Welsh is the de jure official language of Britain and the oldest living language on these islands. Um, it's a very interesting question because uh, we do have colonialism with its far reaching tendrils um, everywhere. And actually previously um, audience members before this uh, 
actual webinar, we were discussing whether we wanted to do land acknowledgements um, and opted out for the, each panelist to talk about the land that they were currently occupying on. It's a very interesting question. Do any of you have anything to say on that? I think land acknowledgements started out with very good intentions. Um, I'm not sure that they're working. Um, so I think one thing that, I mean, people just do them now because it's just been a precedent that many institutions have set forth. And I think it's important to acknowledge the land that you are on. Um, but as Dan said, what we were discussing before, if you're not gonna give the land back, what's what's the point? <laughs> um, so there needs to be more action, I think, associated with land acknowledgement than is currently being done. Um, but that being said, when they first came out, I was like all for them. I had signs that I put up uh, different places that I'd go that said what lands you were on. Um, they had a whole like series of posters that you could just download and print off and put up to educate people about it. Um, I'm just, I don't know if they're, if they're working. So I don't find them super important. At first I was like, oh, cool. Like this land acknowledgement lets me as indigenous person know that this, this community, this organization is considering these things. Um, they are, they know something about native culture and the history of the land that they're on. So that was kind of refreshing every once in a while, but um, I don't think they're always necessary. I'm not going to be mad if someone doesn't do one. Um, action behind the intention. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's like the, the way that they become kind of this rote thing that happens and is what I think is the problematic part. Like, I, I think, I mean, I acknowledge that I'm here in Kiskea, which is Taino land um, when I started because I'm, you know, I'm a guest here. Um, but I think it's what's important is like the, the deep understanding and knowledge and relationship to the land. So if folks are engaging in that work and like really learning about how did they come to this land? How, you know, where did their ancestors come from? Where did they live? Who lived there before that? Who did they have to displace to live in that place? Like all of these relationship questions, I think that's really the important piece of land acknowledgement. So if that's what I try to teach students, I teach like, um, future teachers. Uh, and so I try to teach them like you need to, it's not just memorizing two sentences and spouting it back and saying like, there we go, I acknowledge the land, right? It's like, how do you fit into this puzzle? Like what, what's your positionality? Who are you? That's what I feel like should be coming through land acknowledgements. I think that's very valid. Um, and again, but both of you were saying like, yes, it started off on the right path, but it kind of devolved into this toothless thing. Um, I don't know, I, yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, go on to the next question. Um, okay, so. Ah, another question on museum renaming. So first Americans Museum, Oklahoma City, previously known as the American Indian Cultural Center and Museum. Language is usually the first thing colonization attacks, renaming of places. What level of importance does the panel give to language in asserting culture and reclaiming of settler spaces? Um, it's a very interesting question, especially because I'm still fumbling with my language, you know, Dan de Chenecachon, Francais. So, um, no, we talked a little bit about language. Um, if any of you uh, want to discuss that, you're more than welcome to. I don't care a whole lot about terminology because it, it is constantly changing and different terms go in and out of popularity or, or fashion at the time. So back in the 70s, it was American Indian and then it was Native American. Then it was just Native because we were Native before we were American. Now it's, I mean, it's Native or Indigenous. So all there, there are always changing. Um, it's really funny, I was doing my feast project the last time or maybe the time before and an Indian man come, came up to me, a person from the country of India. And he was like, you keep saying Indian, but you're not Indian, you're Native American. And he kept, he was very upset that I kept using Indian. Um, but I was like, oh, I should have prefaced this in the beginning. I use 
all of these words interchangeably all the time because I don't want to just say one thing all when I'm writing a paper or talking. Um, plus, my family always called ourselves Indians, like constantly. That's what I grew up knowing myself as. Um, in the United States, we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Like legally, we're referred to as Indians most of the time, not Native Americans. So I use them all interchangeably. Um, so I just had to apologize to that Indian man and be like, this is the reasons why. Um, and it was a pretty interesting conversation that we had. So I, I think renaming sports teams names like the Redskins, um, our Washington DC football team was very necessary because that is a very derogatory word. Um, we should be changing things like that. Um, but I'm less concerned about whether it's first Americans or American Indian. They're the same to me. There's an interesting like clarification in the chat as well, I think from the same person saying specifically using indigenous languages, not Anglo terms. I think that also changes the framing, but no access. Ah, oh. go ahead. Um, yeah, for uh, terminology and all that, my experience over here is, is also very different too, because what Max do, we, what Max do is one of the uh, last communities to still have a very, very strong, um, uh, to still have the, the Cree, the original Cree that we had over here, the, the uh, original EU, I can't pronounce it, EU, EU Moon. Um, I think I pronounced it wrong, but. <laughs> But the Cree language. So like um, we're actually having a very interesting time in renaming back to our original uh, terms. Like for, you know, I keep, I, I say I'm Cree, but it's it's not actually very correct because, you know, the Cree, there's a, they're, you know, on the other side too of James Bay. And, you know, we're, the, there's Crees, um, they just use that word. Um, I've never heard my elders say, you know, I'm Cree. Um, it's always EU because that's the right the right term too. So over here it is it is um, it is different than you know uh, down south or in other places where you know uh, colonization like commun the community here was only built because there was the army base, but this was originally a gathering place for the Korean Inuit too. Um, the history is long; it's a very very interesting history. So you know renaming we still have our um, uh, we still use the Korean names for all the places and um, people are trying to use the English terms, which I disagree with myself because it is very important that, you know, we keep, because when you explain it in Korea, it makes so much sense where a place is or why it's named this way. So, you know, it's when you translate, I guess, like when you translate in English, uh, a story, it might not sound as funny as it is in Cree, in EU, uh, in, in the Cree language, or, you know, a place you'll describe it. I've seen some lakes here <laughs> that are just, uh, that are named in English. And I'm like, that makes, why did you name it that? But it's like, no, it's because the translation in Cree is like completely different. But, you know, in the English, they just took whatever. It's like for my name, Mukash, they don't think that that's what it is uh, originally, but when um, the uh, fur trading company came here and um, the Hudson Bay company, uh, they had, uh, they mixed up a lot of names and a lot of names were shortened and a lot of names were, you know, taken away. So we think, we think our name is either like Mikash for uh, like a, I could be wrong, but I think it's like Scottish or it's for short for Mukshan, which is like to feast which would make sense. But because of uh, when they took that and completely changed it, it changed the meaning. Like we have no idea what Mukash means. It means nothing in our language. <laughs> so, you know, for all that, for me over here, it is very important that we, you know, keeping the, the original language, even if it is hard to pronounce, it, it's important. I think not shaming people who are still trying to get that pronunciation right or get that you know just the effort for trying and also just a good rule of thumb is no like ask the person how do you identify are you Métis are you um 
Pa Jorge, are you are you you like where you know how do you identify and they'll help you out people people will usually help you out um so i believe it is 7 30 um i'm just going to see if we can tackle maybe another question uh or so um oh and there's a puppy on the screen that's lovely that's that makes this a beautiful webinar um Maybe we can do uh, just one more question, um, but maybe a small one. Um, what would be your dream show in the UK gallery? It's a great question, either commercial or not. How would you curate it um, and produce an exhibition of contemporary art that speaks to you? So Grant, not, you know, not a, doesn't matter. <laughs> One thing that I would be interesting, interested in doing, um, in the mid 1800s, a lot of our tribal members went to the UK and to France um, on a trip with you know, some colonists that had come over. And they basically just like took the Iowa people, I think it was Iowa and another tribe. They took them around and just like showed European people what Indians were. So it was kind of this weird like performative show um and then the Iowa people also got to see some very strange things about European culture that they were not um okay with the one of the funniest ones was dogs actually um Iowa people could not understand why all these French people were walking around with little dogs um when there's people starving on the street it's like why are you taking care and putting this dog in clothes when there are people that need help that could eat that dog. Um, so our, our tribe was just like blown away with how people were treated by their own community members over there. So one thing that one of our tribal members has done before me is to go to these different locations. And some of the Iowa tribal members on this trip passed away on it and are buried in England and in France. Um, so another person has gone around kind of like tracking this steps that our tribal members took and trying to find some of the um, burials or sites that these Iowa member, tribal members were buried at. Um, and I think I could envision some sort of project where I do the same thing, take the same routes um, at some sort of performative thing, because that's basically what they were doing over there is performing for all of these Europeans. Um, so I would love to do something like that if I got the funding to do a performance project version of the yeah horrors that'd be a really interesting project it's not about that question but i just had to laugh uh what you just said Sydney, because my aunt is always telling me like be careful with the dog in the house especially near the kitchen <laughs> because that's that's not a good place for a dog unless you want to end up in the dinner so that's just made me laugh my grandmother would always, um, I would always want stories because she used, to, she would have animals, you know, growing up. And I was like, oh, did you pet them? She goes, no, they were, were animals. Like, no, they were food. What are you talking about? And like, oh, you used to hunt, you know, used to hunt and, and you pet them. No, we ate them. <laughs> like, so very, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and it looks like it is 7.35, so I think we're going to end the webinar with that. Um, for